it's a huge pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Rafaela Heeson today, or Rafa, as some of you will know her as. Um, Rafa's really, a, you know, a rising star of primatology and, uh, you know, a fantastic cognitive science and comparative psychologist who we're very fortunate to have working with us at Durham University. Uh, Raf is working as a postdoctoral researcher at the moment, uh, working with myself and others um, for an ESRC funded uh, open research area grant on the um, on the uh, evolution of emotion expressions, which builds upon Rafa's background in studying uh, great ape cognition and communication, um, of which she's going to be talking about today. So Rafa, Rafaela did her, uh, her PhD at the University of Neuchâtel um, with a group of supervisors, uh, Professor Klaus Zuberbula, Adrian Bangata, and Emily Jonti, um, who came together on a, a really, a really innovative project that Rafa led on uh, joint action, which Rafa is going to be speaking to, to, to us all today about. Um, and Rafa also really has uh, done exemplary research in her master's, uh, which she did at uh, the University of Roehampton with Dr. Uh, Professor Stuart Semple on linguistic laws in animal communication. So she's really moved from uh, sort of broad animal communication into some really interesting cognitive questions about the nature of communication in animals and now is sort of bringing in some research all about emotion and its, its integration with communication. So, uh, yes, do keep, keep an eye out for Rafa's really, really exciting uh, research and papers. And it's a great pleasure to uh, be hearing more about your research today. So thank you very much, Rafa, and looking forward to hearing about your wonderful projects. Thank you very much, Zana. Um, Andrew, do you? Yes. Am I fine to start? Or yeah, you're all good to start. And just a, just a quick note to everyone that we've mm -hmm. set up the Q and A feature down at the bottom. So if you do have any questions, please just plug them in there. And then Rafa's going to take about ten minutes at the end of her talk to address any questions from the audience. So all good to go, Rafa. Okay. Thank you very much for this really nice introduction, Zana. Um, good to hear your voice from Uganda. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me. It is the first time that I'm giving a seminar talk in a department. So usually I was talking like 20 minutes. So this is the first time that I can, actually I can talk um, for much longer than that. So that's very cool. Um, I'm going to jump right in showing you this video. I hope it works for everyone. On this video, you can see um, a group of arms carrying uh, a food item together to their nest in circumventing around an object, an obstacle in their way. And this is really exciting because it can be considered, I hope that you can see the image on the right top, a uh, joint action because they are collaborating together in order to achieve a common outcome. And they even communicate with each other because you can see on the top right, these kind of scent marks, these pink scent marks, they communicate and recruit others to help them carry objects when they find them. And they also make decisions based on, you know, the, the spot basically, on the fly coordination, if you will. So you can see it takes them some time, but they get out of that, around that obstacle, carrying their object to the nest. So what we do see is quite an impressive joint activity where two or more individuals collectively achieve a common outcome, which none of the individuals could have achieved alone. And we do see that quite a lot in the animal kingdom, right? We do see interspecies collaboration, like the, the, the fish that you can see on the top left, also um, within the species as these wolves uh, collaborate together to um, sort of hunt that bison. But presumably joint action in humans is somehow special. And the reason why it's assumed to be special is because it involves a kind of mental uh, capacity, what we call, or what Tomasello and uh, Bratman and other people call shared intentionality. So it means that people are mutually aware about the fact that they are doing something together. So their actions are interdependent of each other and they help each other to jointly succeed and they, um, so that manifests in, in behaviors such as joint attention and referring to mutual knowledge, for example. So this is quite a, a theory loaded a definition. Um, but I would like to show you an example of like an everyday life scenario where that shared intentionality feeling becomes um, evident. 
So you can see like a conglomeration of people and aggregation of people might be might be considered as a collective um, gathering. But if you look at these two tables and that I circled here, they actually have quite maybe nothing in common because if you imagine that woman in the back seat there is getting up to the bathroom, then the, the guy that's sitting in front having lunch with his friend is probably not even recognizing that, okay? But if we look at these two friends having lunch together, then things turn out a, bit, a little bit different because here there is a feeling of mutual obligation, a mutual responsibility involved, what we call joint commitments. It means that both of these two friends are mutually aware that they're doing something together and they take mutual responsibility for that interaction and the partner. So we can consider that a kind of mental product being part of joint action in humans that makes them presumably special. But every product also has to have some kind of process preceding it in order to become a product, right? And it is that kind of process that we are especially interested in, in the research that I've done at the University of Neuchâtel during my PhD. So uh, in the human literature, um, people have described how people, humans get into that kind of joint commitment through the process of joint action coordination. So in order to even know that we're doing something together, we have to establish joint commitment in the very first place. So we have to go through the process of an entry phase. And the entry phase involves several coordination problems. So for example, if you, if you imagine you see your friend on the, on the road randomly, um, you, you, know, you have to do things like behaviorally and communicatively in order to um, get into the state of joint commitment with that person. So you might, for example, uh, select the partner and the behavioral correlate um, that helps you to solve that coordination demand would be to approach the partner, to gaze at the partner um, in order to establish mutual attention with that person. Both of you need to orient your bodies towards each other. You need to engage in mutual gaze. You also need to verify that your partner is ready to interact, like um, maybe that person doesn't have time or doesn't want to interact with you. Um, so you might use uh, speech or, um, to coordinate that or language in general. So like you might say, hey, what are you up to? And then you both need to agree on the roles, content and the nature of the activity. So for example, you might say, hey, do you want to grab lunch down the road? And uh, then the other one has to agree and, and say, okay, yes, I am willing to do that. And maybe you're going to discuss which restaurant that you're going to choose. And the fascinating thing is that once you are in the joint action together, so imagine those two friends sitting at the table eating lunch. Um, if one partner gets a phone call, that guy on the right, um, joint commitment is threatened. So it's threatened because you put some pressure on your partner who is waiting for you to get done with a phone call. And so you need to do things to maintain joint commitment and not hurt your partner's persona or public image um, his or her face okay and um, when the, that phone call happens you need to do things in order to suspend the activity you might do things to check if your partner agrees and is ready to suspend the activity you might even ask for permission that might be something along the lines of hey um hang on are you okay if i get that call because if the partner really really is something talking about something urgent might not even prefer that you take that call if you then do take the call and you have mutually agreed that it's fine to do that you don't just walk off that would leave your partner quite depressed and maybe angry right you do things to again come back to that to maintain the joint commitment you resume the interaction you apologize you justify you resume the activity by reconstructing a topic. All of those are, are coordination problems that they're kind of invisible, but they become visible through the behavior correlates. We all know that. So for example, we say things like, sorry to have let you waiting, or this was my boss, I really had to get that call justifying why you left. And also trying to reconstruct a topic. So it's, it's just cooperating in a way that, you know, I'm helping you to get back to where we were before. Um, your sister, what did she do? 
And at the very end, you don't just walk off. You, you don't just leave that person. Um, you actually go through the process of an exit phase together. You do things to project that the end is near and that you're happy to disband and dissolve the joint commitment. That requires mutual coordination. You might signal mutual readiness for ending the encounter. You might exchange okays if you're on the phone or you might just walk together and by kind of turning your body, indicating that the end is near, that you might you know, soon walk off. You, you probably try to display some relationship continuity, the will to engage with that person another time. It was so good to see you, see you again soon. You might uh, engage in well-wishing. You might say things like, take care, good luck with your meeting next week. And at the very end, when you're ready and things are kind of have been addressed, you might exchange uh, goodbyes as a kind of leave-taking device. So we can actually study joint commitment as a process. We can study how people get to the point of joint commitment and how they get out of it or in the middle, maintain it. And this is the critical point that guides me through this presentation and my entire research is that I'm fascinated to understand the visible coordination efforts and take them or study them as markers of joint commitment as we do so readily in humans. And that kind of comparative framework can help us to understand joint commitment in animals without a theory laden um, mentalistic account, if that makes sense. And we do have. We have put forward a couple of papers if you're interested to check out a little bit more in detail that kind of framework. And today I'm going to talk to you about some results that we have in order to provide evidence for joint commitment as process in the great apes, our closest relatives. But before I'm going to get to my results, I would like to explain to you two things that I find fascinating, other people have been finding fascinating. Um, and I'm going to call them coordination smoothers. There are many coordination smoothers, like um, communicative signals in general. You might, you know, engage in nodding and you repair your um, uh, communicative utterances if your partner doesn't understand or something. But two coordination smoothers that I am particularly interested in are phase management and emotion communication. And I'm going to just quickly show you what that means. Okay, I hope this video works. Please, um, Andrew, do let me know or anyone if it doesn't. So I'm going to let you enjoy this video where phase management becomes visible. And I'm going to tell you that phase, I'm not talking about the actual phase, but I'm, talk, I'm talking about um, the public persona, your public self image that you hold for yourself, that you can also lose. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the um, pardon me. That's right, pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices and on North back Korea. back to the activity. So what you've seen here, if you paid attention to the communicative signals that this poor man has given in that interview, he has apologized quite a lot and he has resumed the interaction. So what he did we might call phase management, right? He managed his own phase, his own embarrassment to not lose it, his phase, but also the other person's phase. And he, he has been in a quite serious business meeting, so to speak, with BBC um, News, World News Today. So um, this is quite embarrassing. Um, and what, what this means is what you see in this little formula here. So I'm not gonna bore you with that formula, but I would like you to look at it because it, it's a formula that has been proposed by Brown and Levinson in their seminar series on politeness theory, which is very, very exciting because it shows that in principle, this is what people do every day. They try to beware and manage face in all kinds of joint action. So W is basically the um, weightiness of a face threatening act to someone. So the risk that you, you put threat onto someone's face and it's dependent on the social distance of you and your partner 
the power difference between you and your partner and the cultural ranking of the imposition that you make, right? So I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna just talk about what that means in real life because that's what we're particularly interested in. You see two kind of um, uh, aspects. The aspects that I explained are social bond or social di uh, distance as, as another uh, explanation for it and rank difference. So you might imagine that if you interact with um, a friend or someone like your friend who's quite equal in rank probably, um, you might say things like that are quite short and very explicit. You don't say things unambiguously, uh, right? You say it direct, like, hey, buddy, what's up? Or, hi, Joe, do you want to play? But when you um, interact with someone that you don't know at all or not very well, or someone that is higher ranking, like a professor or teacher, um, you might say things with a little bit more ambiguity to leave some room for denial. So you might say, hi, good day. Mr. Smith, how have you been doing? Or hello, uh, Professor Maynard, would you perhaps have time for a question, if you will? We know it from everyday life. So what it means is this pattern, and I would like people to bear in mind this pattern because it's gonna guide us through this presentation. It means that if you, know, you use less communication effort, you make less communication efforts if you're interacting with a friend, or if you were interacting with someone that's lower ranking to yourself. The second part that I'm gonna talk about in the great apes as well is emotion communication, how it's an actual fuel, an actual motor of joint commitments. Um, there is a large void in the joint action literature of what emotion sharing can do to fuel joint commitment. So for example, imagine um, you ask me, um, you want to work with me on a paper and I'm telling you, okay, yeah, that's fine. You, you might actually believe that I'm not really serious in my commitment to that. Um, so I might break off from it. But if I tell you, oh my God, that would be so exciting. You might think, okay, that's a little bit too much, but she is probably very excited about it. So very much not uh, inclined to break off from it. So um, it's especially the sharing of emotions, the communicating of emotions that I'm interested in that can be a driver of jointness. They are defined at the very minimal, uh, 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 the minimal architecture, let's say, um, is defined as that emotions are expressed verbally or otherwise by one person and that this expression is perceived consciously or unconsciously, here it doesn't matter, by another person. And the critical ingredient being that wise perception of excess expression leads to effects that function as coordinating factors within an interaction between the two. That is the critical ingredient that you need for it to be important in joint action. So let's look at our two guys having lunch. The phone call, the phone's ringing, interaction breaks, and the guy uh, leaves. Well, next day you see your friend, you probably will, will say things like, I'm really pissed off that you left. So that is an, like the emotion probably is still kind of there, but it's not immediate. You can postpone that, you can delay that, and you can talk about it intentionally, which then triggers empathy. People around you who might see you cry, might empathize with you and might console you if you have a problem, but also the actual partner, the guy that took the telephone call might reconcile with you and that reinforces your relationship and, and triggers jointness in that moment. So it helps you, communicating your emotions can help to re-uptake previous commitments. You might go out for dinner right away to make it up for it, but it can also reinforce commitment strength in future interactions with that person because that person is very much um, trying to not do that again, okay? And one more aspect to bear in mind is that we can express emotions inadvertently as like an impulse of emotion, where we can, we can use um, language to um, describe and communicate what, what emotion we are experiencing, what we, what we think we are experiencing. And there are accounts that say that, well, the inadvertent expression of emotion is probably something that we can study in non-human animals but the intentional communication about the emotion and that awareness and control over how we can communicate about it is probably human unique okay you will see that i'm 
very quickly now getting to the actual question, the major question that drives me, which is how has this massive interaction engine, if you will, ha uh, evolved? I mean, clearly humans cannot have evolved it completely like recently. I mean, there must be some hallmarks present at least in the sort of our phylogenetic relatives, our closest relatives, which are uh, the great apes. And so the hypothesis of this research of mine is that joint commitment evolved gradually towards greater cognitive complexity in humans. And some of the basic features might be present in the process of joint action coordination of our closest relatives. Meaning, if that is true, it would suggest an early emergence of the underlying cognitive and architecture for joint action prior to the human and non-human primate split. So we would find um, some of these hallmarks present in our closest relatives. Um, who are our closest relatives? For those who are not very familiar with the um, phylogenetic tree in which we are involved. So you can see um, humans at the top where I, I circled that in the little um, blue box there, humans being closely related to chimpanzees and bonobos. We split from them like about uh, 10 million years ago around that time. And so why do I believe that chimpanzees and bonobos could even have some or exhibit some of those uh, hallmarks so critical to human joint action coordination. Because first of all, they engage in social interactions with role reversals, coordination and communication to coordinate. I do believe that they might engage in something like phase management. I'm not saying they engage in phase management. To clarify, I'm thinking they might exhibit patterns that are approaching the phase management patterns we do see on a daily basis in humans. Whether or not they engage in phase management is something that I, I, I cannot uh, determine and, and it's not something that I, I'm saying that they would probably do. Um, but they form friendships and dominance hierarchies and they are aware about these parameters. Um, and I do believe that they might be able to control at least some of their emotion expressions or communicate them with some form of awareness. Um, I believe that they might be able to do that because, I mean, as uh, Dr. Zana Clay has shown in her pioneering research, I mean, they're capable of high levels of empathic responses to alleviate others' distress. And um, lots of research shows that they express their emotions via facial expressions um, and vocalizations although there is quite a, a lack of research on the gesture component for emotion expressions, I must say. Why do I look at the two species in particular? Because you might ask me, why don't you just look at chimps? That's, that's fine, right? No, I'm interested in both species, especially because I'm interested how, which kind of environmental factors and societal factors facilitate or um, would enhance the evolution of joint action capacities in the way we are interested in them. Chimpanzees and bonobos are quite different because chimpanzees are presumably the living, they're living in environments with, um, well, basically, so they, they're presumed to be more despotic. I'm saying presumed because there's research that shows that bonobos are also not so egalitarian as we thought before. So I'm saying presumably more despotic. It means they're really uh, driven by hierarchy. They have patriarchal societies with strong male-male alliances with males being at the top of hierarchy and harassing the females. Um, they have severe intergroup aggression. So that even comes to like killing other, um, other uh, chimpanzees from other groups. And bonobos have been presumed to be more tolerant, more egalitarian. It means they're, um, they're less driven by hierarchy, um, though they can be quite mean to each other in captivity. Um, they live in matriarchal societies, um, their society is shaped by female gregariousness, they engage in sexual activity to reduce tension, to maintain social bonds, and they share food um, also with strangers or so other groups. Um, there's generally less intergroup aggression, uh, aggression, and they are known for their high levels of pro-sociality and um, heightened uh, emotional capacities, so the empathic 
um, uh, aspect that I explained before, emotion, attention, and general face-to-face -face configurations and interaction. So you might agree with me um, that there might be a kind of difference or variation of observed coordination in these two species, because there are accounts that say that um, more despotic species interaction are quite influenced and determined by hierarchical structures and there's more negotiation in those species who have who are more egalitarian okay so we might find differences in the joint activities between these two species and the level of coordination with bonobos probably showing higher levels of coordination than chimpanzees okay so i'm going to get to the grips of my talk i'm going to present to you um three studies um not into in too much detail, but I'm going to um, show you the key results of these three studies addressing um, joint commitment as process and uh, possible patterns reflecting phase management in uh, bonobos and chimpanzees. And I'm also going to talk to you about my uh, newest research with Dr. Zana Clay and uh, the group uh, at Durham University and some you know, peaking insights and ongoing projects as well. The first three studies uh, have been conducted with my, uh, super, my PhD supervisors. So this is part of my PhD thesis at the University of Neuchâtel. Um, so here goes a thank you to my supervisors. And uh, I would like to talk about the very first study, um, which is an experimental interruption of a bonobo um, joint action. If you remember that kind of process that I showed you, how, how people like how humans get into joint commitments, we in this study were interested in the kind of thing that happens in the middle so presuming that bonobos maybe have some kind of awareness about social commitments we would assume that when they're interrupted in their joint activities they probably will resume the activity and not only that they probably also communicate to suspend the activity and to re-engage partners so it's not enough to just resume right i mean any dog that's barking at you who wants a toy is not going to give up and elaborates and continues until that uh, is reached. Um, but we're also interested in whether they have that kind of awareness in the way that they use their communicative signals. Um, yes, so just quickly about the design. So we had interrupted social activities, but also solitary activities as a kind of control because you don't know if whether they do re-engage, that is a reflection of the, the kind of social uh, uh, commitment that drives it, or if that's just because they generally like to finish what they've been doing before. Um, the interruptions stimuli were untargeted interruptions and targeted interruptions. So what does that mean? And why did we do that? I'm gonna to come to that in a second. Untargeted interruption is in so far, so it means that we interrupted the entire group. So everybody is running around really nervous it's in so far as bad as a fire alarm in your building. Okay, so everybody runs around and nobody apologizes for stopping the interactions because there is a fire, like you have to get out. And for the targeted interruptions, for example, um, just one person, that was the example with telephone calls. So just one of the two bonobos is called Wei um, by name and gets a food reward and the other partners let waiting. And here I'm going to show you an example of this. Um, this is the kind of fire alarm condition um, where we rattle with the holding door and all the bonobos um, get really excited. Okay, so two of them are going. And sorry, I have to stop this for a second because if you hear the volume really loud, the bonobos have quite high vocalizations, high pitch. So you might find it a bit uncomfortable to listen to the vocalizations, unfortunately. So they're grooming this kind of diet on the left side. And then, then th that's when the noise appears. So the two are communicating vocalizations and gestures. My couple they attend to the interruption stimulus. In the moment when only me. Now pay attention to the two individuals. They find each other back. Olindi is presenting her shoulder to Devani. And they then resume the interaction resumed. with each other after the interruption happened, basically. Which is uh, quite fascinating when you see it the first time, because I didn't even know that this was something that they would do. 
Um, here is the example of a target interruption. That's the kind of telephone situation, if you will. Um, one partner is being called by name. And so that increases the social pressure because the other partner waits and it doesn't get rewarded. Um, yeah, that's quite um, bad. <laughs> But okay, so you can see these two bonobos are turn it down a bit. screaming. And then there's the keeper calling Daniela. Daniela touches Ukela. She stays, she resists the bribe for a moment. And I'm a forward a little bit because Daniela is old and very slow. Then she leaves, she decides she leaves. And she scratches herself which is an indicator of stress in primates. She's not sure, looks back, apparently fine. Then she walks really slowly to the door where she will be rewarded with a food item. She takes the food item. And now watch what she does afterwards. Daniela, uh, Ukela is waiting in the back, looking at Daniela. They look at each other. Daniela is shaking her head. She touches Ukela and she re-engages. Like she resumes the interaction of grooming with um, Ukela at the same location. Right, this is... Um, uh, I forgot. Okay, so we're interested in the resumption likelihood exactly. So between these two, and we predicted that if they had some kind of joint uh, commitment or anything the like, uh, they should probably uh, resume more of the social activity because it's the driver of, of that behavior. And we also investigated the phase management aspect uh, with the social pressure. As I explained to you, the target interruptions are more pressuring because one partner is waiting for the other. And we also looked at the um, social bond and rank differences. So um, as I told you before, we were interested to look whether they are kind of approaching patterns that we see in human joint action, where they communicate less with friends and less towards lower ranking individuals. And at the final bit, we also looked at the social awareness. So, I mean, you could argue where well, they communicate just more because they are nervous or something when they interact with a, another partner that's a higher ranking or something. Um, but we also wanted to know what they understand from their own joint action roles. So do they take responsibility for having initiated that interaction in the first place, um, for being the active groomer, um, for, for example, if they themselves stop the activity, do they take any um, responsibility and communicate more because it's their fault that they leave, right? And so we um, like to, we first look at the resumption likelihood. So that's when the bonobos re-engage each other, resuming the uh, activity that they had been doing before. And here you can see the first graph. So this is a Bayesian analysis. For those people who don't know what that is, basically um, the critical thing is like on, on the bottom there, you can see the 95 credible interval. If the credible interval is kind of like minus and doesn't cross zero, or it's positive, doesn't cross zero, it means that there's a, a, a substantial effect that we understand it that way. So the, this graph shows the probability of activity resumption as a function of the condition that we tested the bonobos in. You can see that the social condition, so when they are engaged in grooming, they are more inclined to resume an activity, okay? resume the activity with the same initial partner that's critical not with anyone else and um, there's also some variation in how they are motivated to do that for example you can see on the right hand side in that social condition the probability that an individual takes an initiate initiative to resume is dependent on their role in the beginning of the interaction when they themselves have been the initiator they're also more inclined to take responsibility and to get you know, to, to get that individual back to come, to come back to the interaction. And so let's look at the communication involved because that's really uh, more critical than just resumption rates uh, themselves. So we were interested in the suspension communication and the resumption communication. 
And let's look at the social dimension. So here you can see the probability that a bonobo communicates to suspend a, uh, an activity um, based on the social dimension. So based on the social bond strength with their partner or the rank difference that they have with positive rank, meaning here that the individual was higher ranking than the partner. And what you can see is quite interesting because you can see that the, the bonobos, they are inclined to communicate less to friends that's okay to just leave when it's a good friend, basically, which is, which is quite similar to what we see in humans. And then we also see that there's less communication to lower ranking individuals. Although this effect, as you can see in the curve, is um, it's less strong than the social bond, right? And then we also looked, as I told you, about the social pressure and awareness. And this is especially reflected in the resumption communication. So that is when bonobos come back to their activity partner. When they come back to the activity partner, how do they communicate? They communicate more if they were interrupted in the targeted interruption. So when just one partner breaks off, there's more to communicate about when they get back. And although this effect is less strong, as you can see in the raw data in the back, you can see these points, that this is raw data and the kind of diamonds, sorry, I should have said, are the model results. So that's the estimate based on the model, considering all the other factors that might influence our result. And you can see the effect is less strong, but they are also more inclined to communicate when they themselves are responsible for stopping the interaction and also when they had been again the initiator. So that's, that's also the, the kind of result that we find all the time. So there are some aspects of joint commitment understanding evident in bonobos and patterns that make us think that they might manage some or appease their, their partner in some kind of way similar to face management. Now, you, you might tell me, okay, well, this is an experiment, you know, it's just one group of bonobos. So what about chimps and what about other bonobos? Okay. We also looked at joint commitment in many other groups. We looked at it in chimpanzees, we looked at it in bonobos, and also in natural interruptions when we didn't put artificial interruptions, but when, for example, a third member enters uh, and disrupts the, the joint action of two individuals. And we were particularly interested in what the bonobos or chimps remember from what they have been doing before. What is the, is there a kind of goal permanence so would they continue to groom the same body parts, like as if they were to re reconstruct a previous um, action scenario? And would they also uh, continue to play the same play type that they had been playing before? You know, so a little bit more detail. And we also were interested then in the species differences, because I mentioned to you that bonobos, we predicted them to be more, co more collaborative than chimpanzees in these uh, interactions. So we looked at really, painfully a lot of interactions which i can tell you the video coding was a, a bloody nightmare we looked at 1180 natural interactions of play and grooming three chimpanzee groups at three different sites and two bonobo groups and we were interested in the resumption likelihood when they had been interrupted would they get back to the activities what is their sense of goal permanence and are there species differences now I'm going to let you witness some of the, the evidence. So there are two individuals here grooming each other and there's a third partner joining that interruption and you can see what they do. So grooming. And then there's a third guy coming in, but she grabs the original guy and continues the grooming. And there's another interaction that I'll let you witness um, where this time there's a noise in the enclosure. So the two bonobos are interrupted, not because a third party interrupts, but there's a noise in the holding. So grooming, there's a noise, they stop. They attend to that interruption. And then you can see that the lady is sitting down there clapping and then she uh, takes back the activity and grooms the partner. And so now I let you see the results. So the first graph on the left shows you the probability that the bonobos and the chimps resume the interaction after a natural interruption. 
as a function of activity type. And you can see that it's quite um, a lot of times, like a lot of times they go back to their original partner, no matter what happens um, in both contexts. But we can also see that bonobos, at least in grooming, not in play, are more likely to, to, to resume than chimpanzees though both species are, have quite high levels of uh, resumption. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, the probability of action continuation. So it means um, the likelihood by which the bonobos and the chimps groom the same body part after the interaction or uh, play the same play type. And you can see again, the same pattern, both species do it quite often, um, but in grooming bonobos do so much more than chimpanzees. So we can see that there is communication going on to suspend and re-engage and there's some form of mutual awareness and in bonobos at least we do find some patterns of appeasement or um, yeah similar to phase management if you will but you might ask me so how do they even get to the point that they might think of um, being committed to each other yes that's something that we were also interested in we wanted to see how they would use a mutual gaze or you know if is there anything mutual going on to get into an interaction and to get out of it so like humans similar to humans would they engage in mutual gaze and exchange communicative signals before they are doing something together and after the activity has ended um, and therefore we investigate i'm telling you about the th third study in which we looked at entry and exit phases in great apes so social grooming and social play. And I'm going to present to you some examples again, because it's to exemplify what we have seen. So this is an example of where an entry phase is present. So two individuals see each other and get into a grooming activity. Here's Devani sitting and Kalele arriving. They engage in mutual gaze, which we, we define as that's when the entry phase would start because they have seen each other. Devani then uh, reaches out with his leg two times, moves it towards Kalele, moves his hands, and then two times. And then, but then there's a kind of break. So, I mean, who knows what they're doing in that time. Kalele is looking at Devani. Then he jerks his head and uh, Devani presents his arm and then they start grooming. But it can equally happen that there's no um, entry or, or exit phase happening. And that looks like um, the one I'm gonna show you now. So this would be coded as no, um, no entry phase. That's really when one uh, partner moves to the other and starts grooming without coordination without communication or mutual gaze okay so it's just starting walking right up to it there was no entry presence and for the exit phase so that's when the partners disband after they have finished their interaction um, this is an example there are two individuals play chase playing and you can see the play phase and da, da, da. and then you can see um well you can see i'll let you watch it So this is like an exchange of gestures, mutual gaze. And the head to head gesture and then the individual. They're done. Something has happened that both are done. And that, that other male walks off and there's one more monitoring gaze of the other individual and then they disband. Another exciting example is that one. I'm just going to forward a little bit because they are so slow. They are grooming. So the left chimpanzee has the right chimpanzee's hand in the hand basically. Grooms the finger or whatever. And then he's done. Then he gets up leaves the hand, goes away, comes back, takes the hand, 
looks at the the other one and moves it towards his mouth while looking at the other and then walking off okay and then there's one there was one more case and this is an example of where the uh, exit phase is absent just to give you the other extreme Oops, a bit loud two individuals are playing and then chase playing running up to each other And then they disband. So there's no nothing going on, no looking, no no gesture or whatsoever. And so we do see that on the left side you can see the bonobos, on the right side you can see the chimpanzees. Well, you can see that the probability of producing an entry phase is quite common in both species. So to engage in mutual gaze, communicate signals, but the bonobos uh, seem to do that more again than the chimpanzees. And you can see that the bonobos are also producing less entries between friends while the chimpanzees, there is no real influence of the social bond on the production of an entry phase. And that's also showing in the posterior distribution of that model. Well, you can see that rank difference doesn't have any effect or whatsoever on the species entry phase, which was surprising to us, but apparently not. Um, and for the exit phase, the same pattern, uh, bonobos produce less exit phases between friends, while chimpanzees are again quite um, always the same. Okay, and that that species difference also shows up in the model as a profound effect. While again, rank doesn't seem to show a clear effect on the production of exit phases. So I, I hope that you, you agree with me that the external structure of joint action coordination can be compared. And we do find some exciting similarities between the, the three species. Now I'm going to turn to my last part of the uh, uh, presentation. I'm going to turn, talk to you about my first results um, on emotion communication, tactic emotion communication in bonobos. That's work that I am doing with Dr. Zana Clay and Diane Austria at Durham University. And uh, please remember that emotion communication is quite the motor of um, triggering jointness and empathy. Um, if, if you remember that sequence that I showed you at the beginning, is something that we try to understand in the bonobos. So for example, when the bonobos were in a conflict, how did they communicate about these negative, um, the negative arousal that they experience and whether that kind of communication can be considered intentional, even though they are highly aroused and emotional and whether in the way that they use those signals, they can trigger jointness. So they can trigger empathy um, so reconciliation or consolation in their partner. So what does reconciliation mean? Reconciliation means they, the two bonobos have a fight and then the two bonobos make it up for it right after the same individuals who had the fight. Okay. So, sorry, okay. it's quite loud. So I apologize for the, that I didn't warn you about this. Try to show you again. So they communicate to each other, have a fight and then they make it up for it, right? in the ways that bonobos do. And then consolation means two individuals have um, a fight and then bystanders approach the individual who is in distress and offer alleviating contact support. Like embrace or sexual interaction. Katako. Katako PC. Which then they, they kind of walk off. It often happens that the well, individual in okay. distress um, stops signaling after. So the first thing that you want to understand, if you want to understand if signals are used intentionally or socially, you must understand if they are if they are socially used, because otherwise it would be useless. Um, so what we found is that the number of signals that bonobos use in these conflict situations depend on the audience um, members around them. The more bonobos are witnessing the fight. Uh, the the victim will be inclined to communicate more okay and now the question that we were interested in does bonobo communication style trigger a certain style does it trigger empathy in others and here is the model results on the left side you can see all the predictors influence on 
whether they receive consolation or not. It's a binary variable. And it shows that if bonobos use baby-like signals, juvenile signals, we call them pedomorphic signals like, you know, um, a tantrum, uh, something that babies would usually use, or pout moan and reach gestures, then they're also much more successful um, to receive consolation by audience members. Okay, and the third important thing is to know whether they would persist in signaling, because if they don't persist and they haven't received what they wanted, um, then it's questionable if it's an intentional behavior, right? Mm, and you can see the predictors listed again and the effect on signaling persistence. And you can see that when the bonobos receive consolation, reconciliation, they're, they're happy to stop signaling emotionally. So it calms them down somehow. Um, but there's also profound age effect, which means that adults are much more happy to stop signaling when they had received empathic responses by others and babies, immature bonobos, they just are uncontrolled continuing to signal. So, okay, which obviously there is an interesting possible developmental tra 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 trajectory that we can study here. Okay, so I'm going to come to my last uh, slide. Uh, my ongoing projects with the uh, Durham research team and in collaboration with Leiden University, in which we're interested in what are the kinds of, you know, identifying the social emotions which are triggered in joint activity contexts, and also the influence of the kind of joint action context on the social, uh, on the kind of emotion that we show. So we have conducted a human experiment where we put people in a joint activity condition versus a loan condition. Oops, sorry. And we investigated the muscle activity of the face, so the expressivity in general, uh, using a kind of um, computer software algorithm. So these results will come soon. And my last one is uh, a current experiment that I'm conducting at, at Basel with chimpanzees, in which we are interested in what do chimpanzees actually understand from uh, joint action uh, context. Can they infer a kind of emotional state of the agents who are involved in a joint activity? Mm, so we mask the, uh, this is an eye tracking experiment, and we're masking the face of the, and then confront them with the congruent or incongruent uh, facial expression that would be appropriate for that context. So, okay, I'm, I'm turning to the end. Um, is joint commitment uniquely human? Uh, we know that many animals collaborate and the proposal has been that humans only uh, are the only ones that have this special joint action where they engage in shared intentionality. And I must disappoint you, I don't know if, we, if the other animals or you know, great apes engage in shared intentionality. So I can't answer that question because we can't look into their heads. Although my colleague, Christopher Kopenia apparently can look into their heads a little bit by looking with eye tracking, by understanding the implicit understanding. But anyway, um, we can only talk about the joint commitment process and uh, showing that yes, the external features seem to be present and that's providing an exciting future avenue for more research on this matter using those comparative frameworks and up to the proposal of a shared external structure in pan homo with a with a kind of level a shared level of awareness sensitivity to the commitment and partner and a possible intentional basis of communication and basic levels of emotion control and um, this is challenging the idea that uh, humans engage in a special interaction engine and no one else does but that's something that uh, excitingly we have been admitted to be theme editors about this to investigate this with my colleague Marlene Fröhlich so keep your eyes open. Thank you very much, um, especially to Dr. Zana Clay and the supportive lab that I, I'm able to work in. And also to my colleagues, uh, Jena especially and uh, Chris, and also to my past uh, collaborators and who I'm still collaborating with. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I think I'm done. Hello. Hi, uh, wonderful talk, Raphael. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Zana's joined us back down there as well. Um, 
So if we can give it all a virtual round of applause for that uh, wonderful talk uh, today. Thank you all for coming. We have a few questions already in the question and answer box, which I'm happy to uh, pose to Rafa now. But if you have a question that you haven't written down yet, please add it to the box as we go along. Um, so thank you again, Rafa. I'll start with a question from Colin. Uh, he has asked, uh, is joint commitment the key candidate for behavior slash ability that most differentiates the, the pan homo clade from uh, gorillas or orangutans? And if not, what else might differentiate them? I don't know if you're able to see that question and answer yourself as well, Rafa, there. Um, I don't see it, uh, but I can answer it. Okay. We don't know. It's just, we don't know. Like they, we don't know if the orangs and gorillas uh, might also show some awareness or there's a possibility that they show that external structure as well. Um, I mean, I consider it as a possibility due to the phylogenetic uh, closeness, um, but that would mean that these, um, um, the, external the external structure would already have been present in the ancestor that combines all of these great ape species, basically. Um, it's possible, I think, but we, we don't know at this point, I think. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, Ralph, I don't know if you can see the, the Q&A now. I stopped your, your screen share. Maybe it appeared for you down there. Oh, I can see. Ah, that might, might be easier than me reading them all out for you to uh, follow. Yeah, sorry about that. Question from Matthew Hancock's there as well, if you'd like to. Okay, sorry, hold on. No, I, I, uh, for some reason I can't click on it. I'm really sorry. Oh, that's so fine. I'll read it for you. Then we have a question from, from Matthew Hancock's. Uh, he said he found the uh, presentation very interesting and thanks you. Um, he says, to what extent do you think the results are showing joint commitment or shared commitment? Uh, is it still possible to view most of the observations as exchanges of actions to coordinate individual action and not the construction of a shared space of commitment? Um, yeah, it's something, yeah. Mm. Was that the question? Sorry. Yes, yeah, he, he adds, uh, in human economic terms, is it like the apes are exchanging debts rather than building a shared enterprise? Yeah. So the question I mean, is about how to distinguish exchanges of debts versus shared enterprises. I think that is something that we can't decide with the data that we have. Um, I mean, it's a possibility that they engage in kind of that jointness, like that they do you know, like based on their individual uh, needs. But um, whether they construct uh, what we define as joint, uh, shared, sorry, shared intentionality is something that we cannot decide with this data. We cannot look into their heads. Um, but we need more experiments, I think, to address this question. It's hard to address it with observations alone. So I could imagine something like, you know, my colleague uh, Chris Kopenia has done where they had a kind of uh, false belief task or something uh, to address that question with experiments and eye tracking rather than observations alone, I think. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I have a question here. I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Pankuri, if that's right. Uh, how is politeness indirectly correlated with social rank? For example, interactions between kids and parents, if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, can, can can we discuss this? Like, can Pankuri speak to me? Yeah, I, I should be. I'm not sure, Pankuri, if you're willing to elaborate a little bit on your question, I can yeah. let you uh, speak in the chat right now. I'm not sure if you have your microphone set up. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, Rafa. Can you hear hi. me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not able to understand how we can say that uh, if uh, the social rank and politeness are indirectly correlated because if I'm understanding this correctly, um, when if we consider the example of parents and kids, right? So a kid would be at a lower social rank, but you would expect the parent to be, you know, when they're interacting with the kid to be polite. I mean, that's how generally the interactions take this. So what do you mean by social rank here? And if I'm understanding it correctly, that's okay. That's a really good question. Um, I do think that these variables interact with each other somehow because um, like I might have a really good friend of mine might be a professor at the same time and I still I still tell them everything I think even though our ranks are different we really closely bonded with each other so they can interact these variables um, and so that's the case of parents 
uh, of children where the ranks differ in societal terms, but between the two uh, individuals not because they are really uh, friends and they're family members, right? Um, okay. So I think what we're talking about here is more like um, you talking to someone that you don't know and who's like a, a priest or something. Like if, if your culture considers okay. that as something that is very high ranking in societal okay. terms, then this is what we talk about when we talk about power differences. And in oh. like the bonobo society or, or chimpanzee society, you might consider it as quite scary to interact with a very high ranking individuals because it carries risks. That individual might aggress you, it might take resources from you in the future if you misbehave, um, it might uh, retaliate aggression against you with others, so okay. it's very risky. All right, thank you. Yeah. No, we probably have time for one more quick question here. I see Charlotte has written a question in the chat. Charlotte, would you like to uh, ask your question if your microphone is, is on and working? I've turned you on there. Yeah, hi, Rafaela. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, yeah, I had a question um, because you, you really focus on great apes and I, and I was wondering whether you, you expect other primates and especially some monkeys to uh, use joint commitment and I also was wondering whether conversion co uh, evolution could uh, play a role um, because in macaque uh, species uh, you can you can find some really despotic species and other that are really tolerant so it could be I think a nice uh, comparison uh, to do with uh, these great apes. Yeah that is a very important question I think because um, you might, this comes down to us asking, like, we need to ask the question, what, why is joint commitment important? What kind of society or what circumstances would drive uh, such an awareness? Why does it help you in a society to be aware about commitment and to stick to a commitment, right? Um, and some people argue, well, why do the apes need it? Because all they do is social grooming and if they, you know, come back tomorrow or whatever. And humans need it because they collaborate in quite complex forms and it drives the end result and success. Um, but I believe that convergent evolution is very interesting because we can start to understand whether other animals more distantly related to us, uh, so not based on phylogenetic relationships, um, engage in anything similar to that and that makes us understand the societal um, factors that drives this behavior so I think it, it would be very very cool to understand that yeah brilliant well we, we've now run just a couple minutes over so that's probably a good point to, to call an end to our virtual semi virtual seminar for today but from the Durham psychology department uh, thank you very much Rafa for your wonderful talk today uh, and thank you to everyone from, from all over the world that's been able to attend today. Had some really good questions. So thank you very much for coming and um, we'll all see you soon.